how do you supply that that fragmented market? And you know, some of the big big retailers, like whether it's Kroger or, or Costco or a Walmart, um, I'm not quite sure yet how they're how they're going to respond to that. And uh, that that's going to be that's going to be key. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's Swinet Canada podcast. I am your host, Dan Columbus, and uh, with me today, I have Ken Gall, who is General Manager of the Manitoba Port Council. So welcome to the show today. Really good to be with you, Dan. Thanks for the invitation. Well, th- thanks for, for agreeing to, to be on this. Um, now, I know a lot of us are, f- are familiar with you, especially uh, in Western Canada, but some of our listeners might not know who you are or... or what, where, where you come from. So I'll, I'll just ask you to give a little bit of a background of, you know, where you've been and where you're going. For sure. Well, I, I have no idea where I'm going, but I can talk about, <laughs> talk about where I've been. Uh, you know, grew up in a, in a small town near Swan River, Manitoba, which is uh, uh, our uh, farm in Swan River, Manitoba, just uh, just shy of the, the Saskatchewan border. Uh, graduated from, from the University of Manitoba. Um, spent some time working in Ottawa, both in, in politics as, as well as in, in uh, uh, farm organizations, and then 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 came back home and, and spent some time in, actually in the grain industry. I uh, worked for Agricor United as uh, as their uh, in-house lobbyist for a little while, and uh, then after that merger happened, I moved on to be a, a commissioner of, of the, the Canadian Grain Commission, which was you know what? Fascinating because you get to see how government works from from inside a government department, and um, that's enlightening. We'll put that in quotation mark. Uh, and, and then worked in the in the beef industry. Uh, started uh, Cereals Canada after uh, after the the wheat board monopoly came to to an end, and and then uh, came to to Manitoba pork about uh, two years ago. So some people will hear all that and say the guy can't keep a job. <laughs> I, I mean, I look at that and I think, well, look at the the, the experience uh, that you come with, and and you know, it obviously offers you a different insight into into some of these things too. I won't ask about how government works because I think that might be a, 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 a well, podcast in itself. Another interview on yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it might not be clear even after we do that. So no, no, I'll have to get charts and things like that. Uh, yeah. So uh, I think. That, that that but that's great. I think, um, in, in, and I think that that experience that you have and everything leads very well into the topic of today, which you know is uh, in in your own words the thickening of the of the border, uh, specifically between Canada and the U.S. But I think you know all borders seem to be you know a little bit uh, th- thickening, and and so why don't we just uh, maybe. Uh, in, Talk about what what you mean by that, and 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 some of the things that have come up that you know might be uh, uh, negatively affecting that. Right, and you know the, it's one thing about I've learned about um, you know agriculture in, in general, especially export commodities. Is is we we all think we're we're completely unique, but um, you know there's a lot of similarities in in export agriculture, and of course. Um, whether it's beef or, or canola or pork, um, one of those you know critical elements is is securing international markets. Um, and across Canada, we export about seventy percent of the pork we produce. But but here in Manitoba, it's ninety percent. Um, you know, either leaves the country either on foot. Uh, about three million uh, little pigs go to uh, to the U.S. every year, um, or um, through uh, through through packages. So uh, of the eight million pigs a, a year, five million get processed here in, in uh, Manitoba, and, and three million go to the states, and ninety percent exported. So keeping those markets open, um, you know, is critically important to the to the survival and, and opportunities for for growth for for the sector sector. And we really noticed, you know, even before the pandemic. Um, Protectionism was coming back in style, <laughs> and uh, you, you know you you saw that um, you know call it America first or uh, you know what whatever Europe first. It, it was happening all over the world, and then and then the pandemic hit, and that really has accelerated the that trend towards protectionism, uh, and and we're seeing that in our largest trading partner to the south. Uh, you know whether whether it's it's uh, 
electric vehicles or or you know other other initiatives the the uh what is it the anti-inflation act or something like that that really doesn't have much to do with inflation in the u.s but uh it, it's really it's really a, a revitalization of, of that protectionist uh, approach and you know just to highlight a couple of couple of measures right now that we're seeing um in the u.s and um, I don't think they started out as, you know, intending to be protectionist, um, but that's what's going to happen. And, um, you know, one of those is is Proposition 12 uh, in California. And, uh, you know, a proposition is is a ballot initiative. Uh, so citizens, if you get uh, if you get so many people to sign a petition, you get to put a question on the ballot. And that sounds really intriguing. Um it can lead to some very strange, strange results. And, and this is a, a case of that where, uh, you know, animal rights activists um, put on on the ballot question um, some very specific requirements for, uh, for raising animals in, in California, uh, which is fine. Every, you know, Manitoba has laws for raising pigs that Saskatchewan does and Quebec does. Uh, but what was different about this California uh, legislation is is they're requiring all pork sold at the state, whether no matter where it comes from, um, to to pass pass their their requirements. Um, and the the problem is is it's not really based on on science. Um, you know, it's it's they're they're arbitrary arbitrary measures. And uh, you know, our requirements are different. To you know. Iowa's are different to Massachusetts, who's coming with similar legislation, it is different. So, you know, of those three million pigs that are going down to, to Iowa every year, um, we're gonna have to find a way to make them compliant with those those California regulations. Um, and I'm not sure how we're gonna do that. And that, you know, we're gonna have to find a way to make them compliant with the Massachusetts legislation. There's nine different states that are coming forward with with similar legislation. So we don't we didn't sign the trade agreement with 50 individual states. We signed the trade agreement with the United States. And um, they're not they're not very united on on, on this issue. And and so we get a fragmented market. Um, you know, processors and, and uh, even producers and retailers are gonna have to segregate. Um, that's all really expensive, uh, and it's it's going to discount uh, it's going to discount Canadian pork, um, and it's it's going to discount uh, you know live animals going into the state. So, uh, given it's our the U.S. is our largest market, um, mm-hmm. it's a problem. Yeah, it's I, I I don't know I I personally was a little bit surprised at the the Supreme Court decision upholding it because you know I think we were all kind of maybe it was just more hope uh, you know that they would strike it down given that. Uh, it, it's not the first time that this has happened. And, and obviously, if you put something like that forward to to voters and you say, well, you know, let's give let's give the animals more space. Well, who's going to vote no to that? So it's kind of <laughs> but there is, like you said, there's no understanding or very little understanding of what that means or if the science behind it even even focuses on that or, or shows that. Yeah. And, and the science isn't 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 there. But, um, you know, there there are ways of, of the objective isn't is it bad to, you know, to ensure a high animal, uh, high animal welfare? We all have the, we have the same objective, uh, but we need to do that in a way that preserves our integrated North American uh, market, uh, because that's just so in- incredibly valuable to, and it's valuable to consumers. Um, you know, consumers in California are suddenly going to find themselves paying a lot more for pork um, and having a lot less selection. And uh, everybody along the chain is going to be making a little bit less money. It's it's uh, lose all around. And uh, so, yeah, you know, we're I, I I hope that the government of Canada can can find ways to uh, to to challenge this. Uh, you know, whether whether it's through our our, our Canada U.S. Mexico trade agreement or or the WTO, um, or or to find a, a way to to get to that you know common common legislation again uh, across uh, across the the two countries yeah. and, and I, I think that's that's important right that this is what the consumers are asking for and obviously you know social license is it is is a, is a big thing in agriculture you know we, we focus on the environmental and the, fi- the financial aspects of agriculture a lot but 
especially, you know, in the last five, 10 years, that social license question has really come up uh, a lot more. And so, you know, it's not that we can, we can just ignore it, but like you said, how do, how do we address it and make sure that this actually can happen? Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, I'll use for example, the, the changes in the code of, of practice for the care and handling of pigs is, is going to, um, uh, you know, in 2029, the uh, the requirement is is going to be for for group housing, um, and um, you know that's again focused on on some of those requests uh, from from consumers and from society. Well, right now Manitoba is is we're we're over 60 percent for that for that. So um, you know in in our our sows, of, of course the 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 rest of the pigs are all group housed, um, but. Uh, you know, so so we're a long ways down that pathway. But um, you know, if you're you're a farmer and you've just you know probably spent ten fifteen million dollars building a new barn that's compliant with the uh, the you know the Canadian regulations, and suddenly you find out that you won't be able to sell for for pigs going into California because it doesn't meet that very arbitrary uh, measure. Well, that's you know that brand new barn suddenly has to get. Uh, refurbished again and and that's you know just massively massively expensive um has there has there been discussion over the the last year or so when when this kind of first came out as to like what what we would do if it was upheld or (laughs) uh was it just kind of like oh let's let's just wait and see and and hope for the best (laughs) well i i i wouldn't say it just was was hope for the best but but you know that obviously was the desired outcome was to have have the the Supreme Court in the United States say, "Hey, um, you know this is this is something that doesn't doesn't match with the you know a, a common common United States." Um, but uh, you know there there are some individual operations that have been looking to uh, uh, to to comply, but you know how it's going to be enforced and all those questions are still there's just so many outstanding questions that it's it's been difficult to um, to to get to that answer. Um, so I, I mean, that's from a, from a Canadian standpoint, maybe it's the same discussion on the American side of it too, right? Like are, are states going to stop selling to, to California or the, you know, and it comes down to, to, to the retailers too, really. And, and, you know, are, are the wheat retailers going to be, um, willing to, to segregate for, for those markets? And it's not just California. I, you know, that's a big part of the issue yeah. is. Is you know my understanding, there's at least nine other states that are looking at similar legislation. So um, again, it's not just California. So how how do you how do you supply that that fragmented market? And you know some of the big big retailers like whether it's Kroger or, or Costco or Walmart, um, I'm not quite sure yet how they're how they're going to respond to that. And uh, that that's going to be that's going to be key. Well. I mean, if nothing, the swine industry is adaptable. And I think, you know, we've had things thrown at us in the past that we've had to adjust for, and we've always been successful in doing that. So hopefully, you know, we can come up with <laughs> with something. So. Well, yeah. And then again, you, you know, hopefully uh, this is, uh, we talked earlier about, uh, you know, government. And, and this is this is where, you know, we really do need our our, our governments to, to step up and you know, I, I have to give a little bit of a shout out to to our provincial agriculture minister, uh, Derek Johnson, because he's he's been really engaged on on these border issues and recognizes um, the the potential implications. But uh, we really do need the the federal and provincial governments to to come come to the plate and you know get us to a solution where where we again don't have that fragmented. Movement. Yeah. So. I guess the, the other thing that you've talked about, and I guess in the past we had the the country of origin labeling that we were able to fight and and half struck down. But you've mentioned that now the U.S. is is, you know, kind of bringing in something new that kind of gets around that and is trying to bring it again. So, yeah, it's it's coming back, and that gets back to again that that thickening of of the border, just making it more difficult to, uh, for for products to to freely flow across the border. And, and I mentioned actually that um, uh, you know the U.S. is is the, our largest market for for pork, but you know maybe what what isn't realized all south of the border is that Canada is actually California's largest market for agricultural products. 
Uh, so, so that trade in food and that trade in agriculture products is really going in, in both directions. And that's good for everybody. You know, we want to get our lettuce in the middle of winter. Um, you know, not for $20 a, a, a bag of romaine <laughs> lettuce, right? And, uh, um, you know, we can do that be- because of because of trade. Yeah, you mentioned that, you know, previously uh, the, the U.S. Had, had come in with mandatory country of origin labeling, which would have required every meat product to identify, you know, exactly where the animal was born, where it was raised, where it was processed, where it was packaged. Um, and uh, Canada and Mexico uh, took that to the the World Trade Organization because it was it was discriminatory against uh, against our products, and that's a, a violation of the trade agreements. And, and uh, the WTO ruled in, in, in our favor, and that uh, that those regulations were were removed. But it, it's coming back in a different form now, and uh, um, it's labeled as voluntary. So. So uh, retailers don't have to put that label on. They don't have to put product of, of the USA label on it or product of Canada. Um, but if they do, uh, the proposal is is that they'll they'll have to follow very rigid uh, rigid regulations. And right now, if if you buy a ham in, in a store in the US, um, you know that the the pig there, the animal that that came from, it could have been born in Canada. It, it could have been born in Canada. Um, you know, raised uh, raised in Iowa and, and processed in the U.S. And that really is an acknowledgement that we have similar similar standards. We have we have similar uh, food safety standards. We have similar similar animal welfare standards. Um, so you can be pretty confident that if you're buying an American pork chop, that uh, that it's safe and it's been raised in in a humane way. We might quibble about details, but um, there is an equivalency there and. And right now, the regulations recognize that, and uh, you know that that ham um, can carry the product of the USA label because most of the work um, actually was carried out uh, in the in the United States. Um, but that's the proposal would change that that it would be very rigid that um, you know the if if the the pig was born in Canada, it could not carry that label that. Um, all products of, of the U.S. Would, would have to be born, raised, processed, and packaged um, in the United States. And again, we we ship three million pigs a year to uh, to uh, Iowa and Minnesota, and so suddenly those pigs are are going to come at, at a discount. And those that argue in favor of the the regulation, they say, "Well, you know, it's voluntary. Retailers don't have to do it." But I, a couple of weeks ago, I I was in Costco and. That's sort of my version of torture, but uh, the uh, all all of the pork products, their their Kirkland brand meats were they're labeled product of the United States, and so when these changes come in, is a is a big retailer again mentioned some of the others like Kroger or Walmart, but if these big retailers are they going to go? Oh, okay, we're going to change our marketing all across North America. Uh, we're going to change our our uh, you know our packaging and our labels. Or are they going to look at their suppliers and say you comply? And uh, you know, suddenly what was proposed to be a voluntary measure quickly becomes mandatory, simply because the the large retailers demand. Yeah, I, I think we know how the voluntary labeling thing goes. For when when you get even other examples of you know non GMO or antibiotic free, that anything that they can put on that product that distinguishes themselves or, or makes it look like better quality they're going to do and, and i think labeling something as, as made in america is they're going to view that as as you know only a benefit to the consumers because whether, whether it's a quality thing or just a I, i'm i'm supporting you know american producers you know sure and it gets back to that rising protectionism that um, you know that's kind of the the atmosphere that we're in and, and it, it's happening in canada too you know we're we're talking about, you know, why can't we buy our our stuff here? Um, and uh, it it's it, it's costly, especially for for industries like ours that are are you know so reliant on on export export markets. And at quite frankly, you know, there's opportunities now if if companies wanted to put that label on, um, you know, if they wanted to put uh, 
born and raised, processed, and packaged in the United States, they're free to do so. Uh, but consumers aren't willing to pay for that product, right? Because it's going to cost you more. And um, um, so, if, you know, if there was a if there was a real consumer demand for that uh, that label, um, as you said, there's labels for everything else. You can be assured that it would be on. Okay. Yep. But, and that's all it takes is, you know, if it's going to result in more or a premium or something, you know, for the one that I'm thinking of is you know, we're very, um, very willing to put the Canada pork label on anything that goes to Japan and that because they, they, they really like the quality of, of that pork, right? So, I mean, we take advantage of it too when we can. So it's, it's that, um, it's that rigidity of, of regulation yeah. right? that, um, again, that forces that, that segmentation at, at um, you know, really, it, it skews the market, uh, and uh, and and that's that's where that concern is is, is coming in. So you, you mentioned obviously the importance of of the government getting involved in this, and and you know coming out and maybe like approaching the, the the U.S. and saying, hey, that you know this is this is causing issues or whatever. Is there anything that um, I don't know the 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 individual pork boards or even to the producers or that that you know that they can get involved in that. We, to to kind of you know make help with this fight. Well, I I would I would suggest that you know you know especially if people want more information, you know, get get in touch with us or wherever you're 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 watching this this podcast. You know, get in touch with your your local organization because I can I can guarantee you that uh, you know if if there's a park organization in North America that they're paying attention to this, um, both of both of these issues. So yeah, get in touch, and and we're. You know, we're in, in dialogue with our counterparts uh, in the U.S. and, and uh, you know, talking about, you know, what is a common approach? Um, you know, so we're saying the same things. We're, ho- you know, hopefully going to be saying similar things to the Canadian government as we are to the U.S. government. And same, same with the, uh, the the Manitoba government and the state government. So, yeah, we're 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 talking about this um, a lot. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of hope put on on the the U.S. Supreme Court, but uh, now now we're we'll be talking about Plan B. And I'm not 100 percent sure what that is. <laughs> well, hopefully, Plan B ends up being something good <laughs> and, and yeah, can help. Uh, yeah, wonderful. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I don't know. It, it, this seems appropriate given given the topic, and I think especially with some other of the other stuff that's come out in the news, you know, with with closing up arms and stuff like that. Um, so there seems to be a lot of doom and gloom. <laughs> and, and I was asked recently, like, what, you know, would you, would you give, uh, would you talk about optimism in, in, in the park industry? And I said, well, you know, I think we always need to talk about optimism. I'm going to, I'm going to pose that question to you, right? Like what, do we have stuff to look forward to? Like, what are, what are some opportunities that we could be, you know, taking advantage of? We, we do. Yeah. When I, I was looking at, at where the, you know, in January, where the markets would be at, you know, said to somebody that anybody that tells you where where the markets are going to be six months from now either doesn't know what they're talking about or they're lying to you because there's just so much volatility in the market. Um, and that's coming from a number of spots. So, you know, where it's that downward pressure, of, we've all heard of food inflation. Um, we've all been to the grocery store and, and yeah, food is getting more expensive. Meat is getting more expensive. Um, so, so that's putting downward pressure on demand uh, around the world. And then, you know, geopolitical issues. I, you know, I, I don't think most people realize how big of a, a feed supplier Ukraine was. Uh, but Ukraine was the third world's third largest corn exporter. And, and a lot of, a lot of hogs in Europe were fe- fed on, on Ukraine corn. And uh, so, you know, that is really interrupting uh, international markets, markets as, as well. Uh, and then, of course, I, I think the third big one is is ASF, uh, African Swine Fever. Um, you know, it's it's dramatically impacted Europe, uh, places like Germany and Poland that were big big pork exporters, um, but also places like uh, Vietnam and the Philippines. That um, you know, Philippines is one of our biggest markets now, and it's because of ASF. And uh, the big unknown is what's happening in China. Um, a- ASF has gone through a couple of rounds in in China. Um, have they beat it back? Are they growing their herds? Are they depopulating? It, it, it's pretty hard to tell. And, and so all of that is just bringing around, uh, so much un- uncertainty and, and we're seeing that in prices with, 
with hog, hog prices, unfortunately, fl- falling a lot faster than feed prices. And uh, um, so we, we've gone from from a situation at, at the, you know, in, in 2022 of, of profitability um, to, uh, to, to some pretty, pretty bleak margins, uh, negative margins at, at the moment. But you asked about optimism, and I'm going to go back to all of those things. Uh, uh, you know, Canada, no, I'm going to pick up Manitoba, it's not Manitoba, but, but we are a, a low-cost producer. Um, and uh, the world is looking for more po- protein. The world is looking for more pork. Uh, we see pressures in, in places like Europe that is, is are, are causing their cost of production to go up. Um, and, uh, you know, their production itself to go, to go down. Uh, we're seeing growing demand in uh, in large parts of of, of Asia, um, and and we're we're well positioned to to supply that world at a at a price that others can't do it. Um, so, am I optimistic? Probably not for next week, but 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 you know, we, uh, looking ahead, there's there's a lot of fundamental reasons why. Um, yeah, why? Why you know, especially here in Western Canada, why there's there's real optimism for uh, for for the the pork industry going forward, and we have the processing, we have the infrastructure, uh, we we have uh, we have what we need to to meet that market. So yeah, I am optimistic. It's actually very similar to the answer that I gave when the person asked me because we are you know we're talking about thickening borders, but it's actually the optimism because we are a major exporter. And it is viewed as a high quality product, you know, that we can, we can help to, 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 uh, like you said, feed that world demand for protein. And it's, and it's going to be meat as, as the population grows, it's going to be meat. Right. So it, it is. And, uh, you know, it's, it's as much as our regulatory burden, we complain about it, but it, it also is an advantage many times because, uh, you know, if you go to Japan, there's not questions about is, is Canadian pork safe? Um, it's, it's no question uh, because we we have the environment that ensures that it's it's raised that way. I, I I'm going to ask you one question just because you brought it up and you kind of brought it up as a as a as a benefit because of the impact ASF has been having in the rest of the world and I guess it kind of relates to this because if it ever showed up here we know borders are going to slam shut <laughs> you know so it kind of it, it to me that seems to fit right like you know well because there's got to be plans that are coming into place like what what happens if, if it shows up here and how do we we deal with that it's maybe it's not the same as you know the the thickening border and 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 trade issues but it does seem to apply it's a very thick border <laughs> uh, yeah there's you know if if it were to arrive in Canada our our borders would close at you know, here in Manitoba, that means ninety percent of our market is gone overnight. Um, and and you know, looking looking across the country itself, this is this is a big industry, and uh, you know, this is this is a recession level event. It's it's uh, it will have a massive impact across the entire Canadian economy. Um, so, is there work being done? Yeah, there's a lot of work being done, and, and actually here. Uh, all levels of government, the federal government, CFIA, A Canada, um, you know, really putting the efforts into uh, answering that question, what do we do? And with, you know, targeting, if, if we have to reduce the herd, how do we do that in a way that, um, you know, ensures the industry can recover when borders open again? Um, you know, how do we ensure we continue to supply the the, the domestic market? Uh, and, you know, hopefully that will that will grow as, as well. Um, and, and what do we have to do to help those borders open as quickly as possible? So, so things like, uh, you know, zoning, uh, putting Canada into zone. So, uh, you know, not to pick on our friends at Eastern Canada, but if, if, uh, ASF were to show up in Prince Edward Island, that Canada is zoned at, at in a way that, you know, Western Canada would, would still be, be able to. Uh, to export to a place like like Japan or or the United States, so ensuring those agreements are in place as much as possible with our trading partners, so that if something does happen, um, we can keep that recovery time to be as as slim as possible. But yeah, it would it would be devastating, um, and you know, devastating from a, from a a human standpoint as well too, right? There's there's a lot of jobs that suddenly. They just they just wouldn't be there tomorrow, and uh, uh, 
it it would be it would be a big impact. Ho- hopefully, it doesn't make it make its way here. But <laughs> but yeah, it's it's good to know that there's you know it's been working on. And- there is, and, and and that's something you know again to to we we do do tend to uh, to look negatively on government sometimes, but uh, there there really is a lot of collaboration uh, between you know federal and provincial and. Uh, you know the processors and, and farmers. Uh, it, it is a there, there's a recognition that that it's it really is an all hands on deck and uh, uh, it, it's being done in a good way. It really, really is. Uh, before I get to the, is there any topic that you want to talk about that we haven't yet? You know what? I, I think we've covered uh, we've covered these these couple and uh, uh, yeah. As I said, if if uh, if listeners have questions, I. Uh, especially on on you know proposition twelve or or uh, country of origin labeling, uh, pick up the phone and, and uh, you know happy to talk about it. So uh, I li- I like to finish by giving you the the you know what is what is the take home message if, if you know if anybody after half an hour <laughs> you know if they got, if they come away with anything what would you want that to be? What are, what are the three bullets? Well, one we we can't forget that uh, our take for granted open trade. Uh, and and we have to to continually work to to keep borders open, um, even if it is with countries that uh, you know like the United States. There are there are biggest trading partner and we're theirs, but we still have to work. It's it's like relationships. Uh, we 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 have to uh, we we have to work at it. And, uh, you know the the second sort of take home would be that uh, uh, when we're looking at regulations, if if we get away from basing them on what our science is telling us, uh, that's where we get to having you know arbitrary numbers or arbitrary regulations thrown in, um, and that costs everybody everybody around the, the table. And, you know, the the third one gets up to to the the last point we just talked about is is uh, you know as an industry and governments we we have to work on these issues together. If we if we try to do it alone, uh, you know. An individual province or an individual sector, uh, it's not going to work. Yeah, no, I think very, very good points. <laughs> Everybody needs to, to to work on this, and, and if we're gonna if we're gonna succeed and, and continue to to produce pork, so that's great. It's time for our famous three. Before we end, so we ask all our guests three questions that are kind of. <laughs> And unless of the email, but that's fine. It, it, they don't require a lot of background, hopefully. <laughs> um, the first question we ask everybody is, what is your favorite swine-related book or resource? Well, you, you know, other than this podcast. Oh, of course. <laughs> um, you know what? Probably Three Little Pigs, because there's a lot of life lessons in Three Little Pigs. One, you know, you need to think of that. Um, and, uh, and don't... Um, you know, don't when you're building something, build it to last, and don't skip out. And uh, uh, make sure you can rely on your friends, because if if you can't, there only would have been one little pig. Um, so, so I think there are a lot of life lessons in in, in the the, the oh, three I, little. I, th- pigs. I think that's so. definitely the most unique <laughs> answer to that question uh, that I've had so far. But I, it's great. <laughs> um, so our next question then is, what is your favorite book or resource outside of agriculture? So this this could be anything, right? Something that you read recently that you really liked, or I I I am a reader, so that um, that's probably a, a long a long list. But you know, probably the book I reread every every beginning of every summer is is Sun, Sunshine Sketches of a Little Town, which was. I think written in 1929 by Stephen Leacock, and if you want to learn about politics and, and small town life, it's still all relevant today. So, I uh, read uh, read Sun, Sunshine Sketches of a Little Town and uh, uh, a, a Canadian uh, Canadian icon. I'll have, to, I'll have to look that one up. <laughs> Times when we won't. There, there's a reason we have a Leacock Award, and it's probably oh, not there. You, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Maybe people don't under, don't realize that. So. Um, and our final one, I'm I'm interested really to see your answer on this one because you've been in a number of leadership positions across a number of organizations. Is what do you think sweat sets swine professionals, successful swine professionals, apart from those that aren't? And and that you can define success however you want in that. In that so, I I, I think um, you know, and, and we're in that right now. It's that long long window planning that uh, 
you know, if we were in an up cycle, those those successes aren't going to last forever. And if we're in a down cycle, that's not going to last forever. What's what's the long term term window, and what's the long term goal? And and I I think that that's what uh, that's what separates yeah, being able to see what's coming up in the future and and plan for it instead of reactionary. Which I think a lot of people get into. Well, yeah. Well, thanks. That's that's great. Um, so thanks again for for agreeing and coming on the show. A lot of good information. So I hope our listeners, you know, and enjoy this one and got a lot from it. But I also hope that you enjoyed the the experience. So I, I do. Yeah. Well, I th- I think we'll definitely have you on on again, especially if more legislation comes out or things happen. You know, it'd be interesting to get your take on it. Hopefully, we get news. So well, thank you again, and 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 we'll we'll talk to you in the future.